Well, uh, good morning. Um, <laughs> busy day, busy old day yesterday. What with uh, having a live chat with uh, Michael Cicchini and then with Derek Edmund. But uh, I think we're up and running. Although my screen here hasn't uh, hasn't moved on yet, but probably because there's a delay. But ah, here here we go. I think. One of the things that uh, Derek probably didn't mention was the fact that uh, he'd been in touch with the various people trying to uh, get them to come on and debate with the likes of uh, himself, himself, Sh Sh Sharon, um, obviously uh, Sandra Lane. Um, and it's important to mention as well that there was a large, um, hi Dark Side, um, a community of people that have been looking at this case for a long time and of course the documentary was the sort of culmination of a lot of a lot of time and effort and hard work that's gone into trying to um, answer some of the questions surrounding uh, this case so let's have a look at in effect the document documentary came out as I say last last Wednesday, Thursday. Let's have a look and see um, what the some of the press reaction has been to that. Um, there was even press reaction to the documentary coming out even before it came out, uh, which which seems a little bit sort of like uh, making a murder, how you had people criticising the documentary when they haven't even seen it yet. Um, but, you know, they're just trying to preempt. Uh, criticism, of course, you know. Anyway, I've got a, I've got a few of the articles here that I wanted to go over um, that, that present, um, if you like, um, mainly written by people on the sort of other side of the fence. Um, and I've got them in some sort of reasonable order, hopefully. So let's have a run through them. Number one. This is going back to the 1st of March. So this is in effect, the, the oldest of the articles. And obviously, probe pressure. Luke Mitchell, more than 1,500 signed petition demanding an independent inquiry into Jody Jones' murder conviction. This is written by Paul Roger, 1st of March. Let's come on down see what... See what's being said in this one. Let's close that one for now. An online petition for an independent inquiry into Luke Mitchell's conviction for the murder of Jody Jones has gathered more than 15,000 signatures. The petition comes as a TV documentary about the case Murder in a Small Town, aired on Channel 5, that's Channel 5 UK, uh, last week. See, there's a picture of Luke Mitchell. Was jailed in 2005 for Jody Jones' murder, but has always, always pleaded innocence. Mitchell was jail, jailed in 2005 for the horrific murder of his girlfriend, Jody Jones, who both were 14 at the time in Dalkeith, Midlothian 2003. Despite a lack of forensic evidence, Mitchell was caged for 20 years, but he has always maintained his innocence. And until he um, confesses, then the parole's board, you know, he's due to be released 2025. But that's only if he admits to guilt. If he continues to deny milk, guilt, uh, he, might, he might stay forever. Uh, but uh, the petition was started by Dr. Sandra Lane, a criminologist and obviously author of the book Innocence Betrayed, who is fighting to clear Mitchell of Jody's murder, murder and has been doing so for a long, long time. Dr. Lane also featured prominently in Smorder in a Small Town as she provided her expert insight. And as some of you will know, um, 
I'm that old <laughs> that when I first spoke with uh, with Sandra, um, it, it transpired that she's the daughter of a work colleague of mine way back when I first moved to Melrose in 1983. So, yeah, I'm old enough to say I worked with your dad. So the petition, titled Full Independent Review for Luke Mitchell Case, it argues the case has too many unanswered questions and Mitchell's prosecution needs an urgent and fully independent inquiry. It even says petitioners will raise funds for an independent inquiry to be carried out. So far, it has gained 15,537 signatures in just four days. Sandra. A statement for the petition reads, the 2005 conviction of Luke Mitchell for the murder of Jody Jones in 2003 requires an, requires an urgent and fully independent inquiry. There are far too many unanswered questions to consider this conviction safe. In the spirit of true justice and transparency, we, the undersigned, demand that all evidence and information be re released to an independent panel and not um, the SCCRC for scrutiny. Um, that's the people that have looked at the case so far. Um, for comment, for scrutiny, comment and recommendations, the people are willing to raise funds to contribute to the cost of such an inquiry. Now, the two-part documentary reveals that DNA from two other men was found at the crime scene while Luke's DNA was absent and claims leads and claims leads on five other suspects were never followed up by police. We previously told you, and this comes out in, obviously in the documentary, how two ex-detectives argued that it was physically impossible that Mitchell could have murdered Jody. Around 1.5 million viewers turned in to watch the first episode about the case on Wednesday, with the second instalment airing on Thursday. However, Channel 5 was forced to pull the documentary's second episode after a name was wrongly shown on a suspect list. Um, I think they made a, a very quick edit and popped it back on again. Um, in it, the two detectives, John Salins and Michael Neal, pointed at more likely suspects. The pair say the main person of interest featured at the time of the police inquiry, but it didn't seem to go any further and his name never came out. Mr. Neal then told viewers, for various reasons, like I've said, we can't name this individual right now. We told previously how a witness in the murder trial has asked for legal advice over fears the documentary points the finger at him. The man, now 34, previously admitted being close to where the body of murdered 14-year-old Jody Johns was found in 2003. He fears the spotlight would fall onto him following the two-part show. It was not his name shown in error on the suspect list. Mitchell's mum, Corinne, said she believes her son is innocent and was wrongfully convicted. In an, emotion, in an emotional interview with The Sun, Luke's mum, Corin vowed to fight to clear her son's name until I'm in a box. She added, when they arrested Luke, he was only 15 and I felt absolutely devastated, helpless, angry, every negative emotion you could feel. In a cryptic 
Facebook post. Jody's devastated mum recently posted, the truth will always be the truth. So that was a uh, an article. Um, obviously, there's some more things here. Um, three articles here alone about the case. But as I say, I've just chosen uh, these for now. I'll take us long enough to get through these. Let's just briefly come back here. Not there, back here. Let's have a look at that. Okay, okay, let's move on to the next one. just realized I don't think I was screen sharing at the time but hopefully what I read made sense this time we will share the screen so uh, this is March 2nd by Jane Hamilton and Alistair Clark Jody Jones key key questions and evidence behind the conviction of Luke Mitchell yeah, that is definitely showing up. So that's a, that's a better, better start. A new documentary. Oops. Too hasty there, Paul. A new documentary has cast doubt on the conviction of Luke Mitchell for the brutal murder of 14-year-old Jody Jones. Luke Mitchell arrives at the High Court in Edinburgh during his trial. So, the brutal murder of Midlothian teenager Jody Jones in 2003 and the subsequent conviction of her killer has been publicly re-examined re following a controversial documentary. I wonder who gets to decide what is controversial. Over 16,000 have now signed a petition protesting the innocence of Luke Mitchell, who was found guilty of the brutal murder after a 10-month manhunt by police. I think it was more a case if you, um, as I say, looking back, it was in the papers constantly constantly pointing the finger at uh, Luke Mitchell. Um, there's certainly been a lot of suggestions that the police were happy to feed the press and the press were happy to feed the police and to keep the pressure on Luke. Um, very much a trial by media. And as Jody's family speak of the hurt the documentary has caused them, many have taken to social media to publicly question their role in the murder and even accuse her loved ones of a cover-up. But what really lay behind the conviction of Luke Mitchell and how did a jury manage to decide he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, and yet it, was a, it wasn't a unanimous decision, it was a majority decision. And as Sandra Lane has pointed out, that could have been as close as eight to seven. We don't know. We just don't know. Um, and I would also have to question, it's going to be very, very difficult to get a unbiased jury, given the amount of publicity that led up to this case. Um, it does seem very bizarre how Luke was named right from the get-go. Um, I, th I thought that sort of stuff was not allowed to be done, but Anyway, let's carry on. So, 
So, the Daily Record recently reported on key questions and pieces of evidence put forward at the trial and Mitchell's appeals, all of which have been unsuccessful. Like I said there, Luke Mitchell and Jodie Jones documentary back on TV after they made uh, an edit. Okay. Now 32, Luke Mitchell was jailed 17 years ago for the brutal slaying of Jodie Jones when they were both aged 14 and in a relationship together. Mitchell was said to have experienced a fairly comfortable life living in Dalkeith, Midlothian. And certainly, yes, um, New Battle Abbey Crescent area, very nice, nice houses. Um, I've been there to see various clients over the years. Yeah, very, very nice. Uh, nice area of Edinburgh, um, Dalkeith area in general. Okay, there's like like any place, any towns there, there, there there's one or two slightly um, um, more industrial areas, if you like, you know, where you get... Um, slightly different people but yeah very much a case of uh, yeah comfortable life uh, living in Dalkeith where he attended the same school as Jodie Jones he would go on to become her first serious boyfriend um, for I think they'd been going out together for I, think, I believe it's somewhere between three and four months and the pair had engaged in a physical relationship but unknown to Jodie Luke was also in a relationship with another young woman. I did not know that. That is the first time I've ever heard about that. And given the brutality of the attack, I have to say that I haven't seen much in the way of a, a criminologist victimology report on the situation which I think would have been very interesting. You know, often when you want to solve a case, do a victimology. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Luke was also in a relationship with another young woman. Okay. Fourteen-year-old, and you're calling them a, a young woman? Maybe, maybe the, the, the other girl was, was a bit older. I don't know if you can describe them as, as young, as, as women at that age. They're, they're, they're girls. I mean, a 14-year-old girl. Anyway, okay. How did Luke Mitchell come under suspicion? On 30th of June, 2003, Jodie Jones left home saying she was going to meet Luke. I wonder, I wonder why they keep calling him Mitchell and don't use his first name, Luke. It would be the last time her family saw her alive. Jody was found dead several hours later, brutally murdered in a knife attack. Suspicion fell immediately on Luke and his role in discovering Jody's body added to this and would become a central part of the prosecution case. And I think this has been the, the sort of um, you know, if you were putting things in order of importance, this seems to be the one that crops up first and first and foremost, time and time again. Luke led the search party to uh, Jody's body, um, and in the ten months leading up to his arrest, Mitchell faced constant speculation in the media and from Jody's family. He was first questioned as witness, but police went on to make him the focus of their investigation. Convicted murderer Luke Mitchell is led into a prison van after losing his appeal to overturn his conviction. The prosecution case. Luke's guilty knowledge and the eyewitness accounts. Central to the case against Luke was the fact he was the one to discover her body, which the prosecution said at trial was an indication he had known where the body was all along. 
Prosecutors also, also pointed to an eyewitness who described a man fitting Lute's description in the area just before 5 p.m. And she went on to pick out a photo of Luke, but could not identify him in court. At appeal, judges said that whilst the eyewitness evidence from Adrena Bryson was open to challenge, there were elements that provided the basis for a valid identification of Luke Mitchell and Jody Jones. I find that quite contradictory. But crucially, this evidence was not taken alone and the appeal judges pointed out it came in the context of Jodie leaving her home with the intention of me meeting Luke Mitchell at the place they usually met each other. Here's a picture of Coyne. After pleading not guilty, Luke launched a special defence of alibi, meaning he could not be the killer. He was instead at home cooking dinner at the relevant time, he claimed. But after initially supporting this alibi, Luke's brother Shane went on to give evidence at trial, which cast significant doubt on the story. In his original statement to police, Luke's brother Shane said he recalled seeing Luke in the kitchen mashing tatties, but when Shane was questioned by police... On the 4th of April 2004, Shane said he had been looking at porn on the internet in his bedroom and that it is not something he would have done if there had been anyone else in the house at the time. This cast doubt on Luke's account and that of his mother, Corrine, who had said she had seen him at home at that time. Shane then later admitted on the witness stand that he had discussed his first statement with his mother before telling police Luke had been at home. He admitted that statement was not accurate. The Daily Record reported. Why wasn't Luke's DNA on Jodie? But as far as I know, it was. Yeah, Luke's DNA was found on her bra and her DNA was found on Luke's trousers. But in an agreement between the Crown and his defence team, led by Donald Finley QC, it was decided the issue of DNA wasn't relevant as the pair were in an intimate relationship. The Crown weren't going to say DNA made him the killer, as it was expected his DNA would be on Jody. DNA in this case wouldn't prove innocence or guilt. It was irrelevant to the case. Um, well, as far as, as far as finding Luke Mitchell's DNA on Jody and vice versa, Agreed. But uh, I still think that uh, DNA uh, could be very useful at proving innocence or guilt. What is the significance of the speaking clock phone call? At 4.45, records show that Luke made a call to the speaking clock from his mobile. Police quizzed him on why he had called the service when presumably if he was in his house, as his alibi claimed, there would be other ways to find out the time, such as a clock on a wall. Luke said he couldn't answer why he made the call. Um, <laughs> I think one straight off the top of my head. A lot of my clocks are not exactly at the right time. Uh, I can well imagine looking up the uh, speaking clock to do that. But... You know, I'm not going to uh, start uh, making excuses. Um, but obviously, from a prosecution point of view, they said that this piece of evidence backed up their claim that he was actually on his way to meet Jody at their prearranged time of five o'clock. What about the missing knife and jacket? At the time of the murder... Luke owned a scunting, I've never heard of a scunting knife, which he has never, which has never been found despite an extensive search of his house and the discovery of a sheath the knife was held in. A distinctive Parker style jacket, Luke often, no, 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 now, we're, now we've changed it to Luke, okay, often wear was also missing and it was described by witnesses who saw him that night. 
when police searched his house, the jacket had gone and has not been found. The prosecutor sought to link this with evidence that a log burner in the back garden of Luke's home had been used around 6.30 and 7.30 and later at around 10 that night with an unusual smell as reported by neighbours. What's the connection with the Black Dahlia murder? Two days after the murder, Luke bought a Marilyn Manson DVD, The Golden Age of the Grotesque, which included images of naked women tied together and subjected to a form of abduction. Okay. Manson had an exhibition of the same name publicised on his website, which included images depicting the death of the actress Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia, who was mutilated and murdered in Los Angeles in 1947. Professor Anthony Bisuti, the pathologist who examined Jody's body, body, gave evidence that while not identical, there was some similarity between the location and the injuries inflicted on Jody and those on the actress. Were there any other suspects or people questioned during the police investigation? Several people were questioned extensively by police and ruled out, including most of the people mentioned in the documentary. Mark Kane, who it was alleged was in the area at the same time as Jody and had scratches on his face, was cleared of any involvement by police. His pal, pal Scott Forbes, said Kane, a student at New Battle Abbey College at the time of the murder, had written an essay on killing a girl in the woods and that a lecturer at the college could confirm this. But John Beckett, QC for the Crown, said a statement from the lecturer confirmed Cain wrote no such essay. Hmm. He added that Forbes had told Cain to play along and we will get 50,000 from the newspapers. Cain later died and was totally ruled out as a suspect by police. The whereabouts of all family members was examined to help develop the timeline of what happened. This is routine during all murder investigations and nobody else was considered a suspect. What about the used condom found near Jody's body? Jody was not sexually assaulted in any way. Mitchell's defence team claimed the DNA in the condom belonged to another man, James Faulkner. But during an appeal hearing in 2008, Donald Finley QC, who was Luke's lawyer, told the judges he was dropping any further claims about James, who had already been ruled out of any involvement by detectives investigating the murder. Are there any active suspects? No. Police Scotland have said in recent days they are not looking to trace or question anyone else in connection with the murder. And that's yeah. And that's the, the end of that article. Okay, uh, next we will go to one, two, go to this one. This is also on the second of March. 2021. We'll just go through this bit quickly. Uh, 10 pieces of evidence and facts not mentioned in Channel 4 documentary over Jodie Jones' murder. Let's see what we've got here. A Channel 5 documentary exploring the guilt. Exploring the conviction of killer Luke Mitchell, cast doubts over his guilt last week. Luke was caged for life over the murder of his 14-year-old girlfriend, Jodie Jones, who was butchered to death in East Hayes' Midlothian, 2003. The chilling Crime was featured in a documentary, Murder, Murder in a Small Town, and sparked a petition demanding an independent inquiry into his conviction, but Jodie's family has blasted the biased documentary about her murder, 
which also made a legal blunder, incorrectly naming somebody on a suspect list. Luke Mitchell trial witness fears new crime documentary points finger at him as the killer. And to date, four doomed attempts to overturn Luke's conviction have been rejected. Here, the key evidence and facts cited in appeals, appeal rulings which contributed to keeping Luke behind bars. At the time of Jody's murder, Luke was described as having an interest in knives and owned a four-inch stunting blade. That knife and its pouch were not found during an extensive police search of Luke's home. During another search the following year, the pouch was recovered, featuring a number of inscriptions, including the numbers 666, Mark of the Devil, and JJ 1989-2003, marking Jody's year of birth and death. A further quote also read, The finest day I ever had was when tomorrow never came. A quote from the lead singer of Nirvana. Somebody by the name of Kurt Cobain, if I'm not mistaken. According to pathologist Professor Anthony Sutil, the murder weapon which caused the injury, injuries to Jody's throat was a stout, sharp-pointed blade. When questioned, Mitchell failed to provide an explanation over the missing knife and here is a picture of that uh, pouch obviously and we've got the 666 up the top there and the dates and initials The missing jacket. Mitchell, uh, Luke was reported to have been wearing a Parker jacket on the night Jody was killed. Witnesses described the distinctive coat, which he was often seen wearing on the night of the murder, but it could not be found during a police search of his home. The Crown sought to link this with evidence that a log burner in the back garden of Luke's home was used to destroy the jacket later that night, with an unusual smell emanating from it, reported by neighbours. The court was also told Corrine had bought her son a new jacket, identical to the one that had gone missing. As with the knife, Luke failed to provide any kind of explanation over the missing jacket. And once again we get the brother's testimony. Mitchell, Luke's own brother, raised doubt over his alibi that he was at home, cooking dinner when Jody was murdered. The mother, Corrine, gave evidence that, that when she returned home from work at 5.15, Luke was in the kitchen while Brother Shane told police on July 2003 he recalled seeing Luke in the kitchen mashing tatties. But when Shane was questioned by cops again in 2004, he said he had been looking at porn in his bedroom and would not have done so if there had been anyone else in the house at the time. This contradicted what his brother and mum told police. In court, Shane then admitted he had discussed his first statement with his mother before telling officers Luke had been at home and admitted the statement was not accurate. Coyne was later arrested for perjury, but the charges were eventually dropped. Two other road witnesses. Witness Adrena Bryson formed a key part of the Crown's case against Mitchell. She came forward to say she had seen a male and a female standing near the East House's end of Roan's Dyke path at around 4.50, around the time Jodie had planned to meet Luke. She noted the male as wearing a khaki green, hip-length, fishing-style jacket. Its collar was up, and it had a pocket which was bulging. She identified Luke from Pitchell's, but couldn't ID him in court. She was unable to identify the female, but gave a description of someone with black, shoulder-length hair, which seemed to be contained like a ponytail, wearing a navy blue jumper with a hood and a pair of lighter trousers, which she took to be a pair of jeans. 
Apart from the jeans, the description fitted Jodie and appeal court judges said that while her identification evidence was open to challenge, there were elements <laughs> elements that provided the basis for a valid identification of the pair. Maybe, maybe she also had t two ears, two eyes, a nose and a mouth. And, you know, I mean, that, that that's just it's totally incriminating, isn't it? You know, you see a girl <laughs> dressed the way that a girl dresses with <laughs> and the hair done, you know, and, oh, well, that, that must be that person. Well, okay. Um, and two other witnesses also identified Luke as the young man they had seen at the New Battle end of the path around an hour later. Lorraine Fleming and Rosemary Walsh identified Luke as someone whom they had seen at around 5.40 on the evening of the murder at a gate between the west end of the path and his house. Covered in blood? Blood spatter everywhere? Hmm. That would have been interesting if somebody had come forward and said they saw somebody... Much in that description, but no. Triplets left near the murder scene. Throat slip post. A witness told police Luke, who smoked cannabis, previously said he could imagine getting stoned and killing someone while showing a fellow pupil a knife. He also claimed that the, he knew the best way to slit someone's throat. Jodie was discovered with her hands bound behind her back, her throat slit, and with several slash runes on her body. Again, we get the speaking clock phone call. Luke make a call to the speaking clock, which tells you the exact time from his mobile at 4.54. Police asked why he had called the service if he was at home making dinner at the time, as stated in his alibi, where it was presumed there would be a clock, be a clock, this backed up the prosecution case that he was on his way to meet Jody at their prearranged time. He had been exchanging texts with Jody from 4.35. The messages sent from her mum's mobile phone could... The messages sent from her mum's mobile phone could not be recovered. Hmm. But her mother, Judy, said Jody left to meet Luke at 4.15 and would be mucking about here. Jody's hair clasp. After leading a search party to Jody's body, Luke was able to describe a distinctive hair fastening she had been wearing, even though it was not visible when her body was found. When questioned about the discovery, he was also able to describe her clothing, which was strewn across the crime scene in the dark. The Crown argued that this implied he had seen her much later than just at school, as he had claimed, when her clothing had been different. According to the pathologist, Professor Basitil, a reddish hair bubble, or scrunch, was situated at the back of the deceased head, but was not easily visible among her hair, which was largely uncontained by it. Cocky police interview. Luke Mitchell. Luke was was calculating, clever and dishonest when questioned about the murder of his girlfriend, according to the Crown. QC Donald Fidley had tried to convince the Court of Criminal Appeal in Edinburgh that Mitchell, then 15, was grilled by bullying detectives. The original trial jury heard extracts of the police interview. The schoolboy answered back, calling one officer a F retard. Trial Judge Law Nimmo Smith explained that he had allowed the interview to be heard because Luke was entirely able to stand up for himself. It was also argued he gave as good as he got. A senior social worker from the Dalkeith Social Work Department, who was there as a responsible adult, at no time felt it necessary to intervene to protect Luke. Fifty thousand to seem 
like suspect. I've just gone a bit too too quickly there. A friend of a cleared suspect told Channel 5 documentary Murder in a Small Town that his very disturbed pal, Mark Kane, visited him just a day after 14-year-old Jody was killed with scratches down his face. Scott also said Kane, a student at New Battle Abbey College at the time of the murder, had written an essay on killing a girl in the woods and that a lecturer at the college could confirm this, but John Beckett for the Crown said a statement from the lecturer confirmed Kane wrote no such essay and added that Scott had told Kane to cooperate and we will get 50,000 from the newspapers. Kane later died and was totally ruled out as a suspect by police. Nobody else was considered a suspect. Marilyn Manson DVD. Luke bought a Marilyn Manson DVD, which included images of naked women tied together and subject to a form of abduction two days after Jody's murder. Two days after Jody's murder. Okay. Manson had an exhi 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 exhibition of the same name, The Golden Age of the Grotesque, publicised on his website, included images depicting the death of the actress Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia, who was mutilated and murdered in Los Angeles. Professor Busitil, the pathologist, to examine Jody's body, gave evidence that while the circumstances of death were not identical, there was some similarity between the location and type of injury inflicted upon the deceased and those inflicted upon the actress short. There was, no, however, no evidence that Luke had accessed this website. Police Scotland Detective Chief Superintendent Laura Thompson said, Following this, the discovery of 14 year old Jody Jones' body within a wooded area in East House's Middle Earth on 30th of June 2003, a thorough investigation was conducted by Lothian Borders Police. Extensive forensic analysis was carried out, along with door to door inquiries and other investigative techniques, and a full report of the circumstances was submitted to the COPFS. which I presume is the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, as a result, Luke, who was 15 at the time, was charged with Jody's murder before being convicted and sentenced in 2005. We are satisfied that we do not need to trace any other individuals in connection with this investigation. Okay. What I'll do, I'll pop this other um, article from the 2nd of March. It's also by Jane Hamilton, who was the author of, part author, I think, of, was it this one? I think she was the part author of this one. I'll pop all of these in the description below. Now, that's Paul Roger May March the 1st. I think this was the one Jane Hamilton had uh, authored. Jane Hamilton and Alistair Clark. So, as I say, I don't see much point in reading both of those. Um, they will be obviously very similar. Um, so, moving on to our fourth article. Um, I suppose, I suppose the words I would describe are um, both beginning with you, unfortunate, uh, but you know maybe understandable. Just make sure that I've got everything working okay. Yeah, I think everything's working um, as it should. Okay, let's uh, let's carry on with this last. This is one I just read this morning. This is from March the 4th. Um, free Luke Mitchell graffiti scrawled in park by Yobbs and Rangers Grangemouth locals. Um, Grangemouth, if you, if you head out of Edinburgh um, and you um, follow the River Forth, 
um, heading west. Uh, Grangemouth is about um, 10, 15 miles inland from the, the Firth estuary. So from the, from, the, from the Fourth Bridges, it's sort of west, but it's along the, uh, the coastline, if you were. You know? So Grangemouth is, 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 is quite local. No, that's Barrow Stunas. Grangemouth is, yes, Grangemouth, it is, yes. Sorry, it's a bit further up than that. I'm thinking of Barrow Stunas, Bowness as it's called. Grangemouth, yes, fur, further on up, but still following that, um, that motorway on the sort of south side of the river, and, and it carries on up. The road eventually goes up to Falkirk, and Grangemouth is, is on the way. So in the... Um, Grangemouth is certainly not far from Edinburgh, just in case you wondered. So Jobs have targeted the area in recent weeks, okay, with a number of incidents reported to police. Um, I don't think they could have been in recent weeks up until last Wednesday or Thursday have been interested in uh, Luke Mitchell case because, of course, it's, it was only then that the documentary came out, but maybe... Maybe they are, they are people that know about this. Or maybe it's just the fact that there have been incidents of uh, people spraying graffiti. Anyway, Paul T. Smith, 4th of March, free Luke Mitchell, hashtag justice for Luke. Uh, let's come on down, see what it's saying. Angry residents have hit out at vandals over after graffiti with the words Free Luke Mitchell appeared in a Grangemouth Park. It was spotted on a small electricity building by a member of the public in Zetland Park, which is currently going through a regeneration project. A yobs have targeted the area in recent weeks with a number of incident with a number of incidents reported to police. So this must be the other side. And you can see it says retrial now, justice for Luke. Uh, presume that stands for free Luke Mitchell. The latest incident follows a Channel 5 documentary on the murder of teenager Jodie Jones, whose body was found near her home in East Aces, Midlothian, on 2003. Her boyfriend, Luke, was jailed for a minimum of 20 years. There are a lot of adverts in between those. Luke has lost several... Not quick enough, Paul. You need to be quicker. When you're trying to read these. He has lost several appeals on evidence he has presented to overturn his conviction. The building, situated near the play park, also has the words "retrial now" and "justice for Luke" sprayed over it. Yeah, as I say, Grangemouth, sorry, it's not far from Folk, um, which, as I say, is just heading up the River Forth on the uh, south side, but heading heading west. It takes you inland, uh, Folk, and then uh, Stirling. It has caused outrage on social media. With one person saying, this is disgusting, our lovely park targeted by wasters again. What is, ring with, what is wrong with people? Another wrote FFS. I very much doubt this has been a kid, clearing an, an adult who is setting a poor example to youngsters.
The third postist posted, this needs to stop. More patrols are needed in this park. And why would someone write this in Grangemouth? This poor girl wasn't here from here. Needs removes ASAP. I presume he meant to say this poor girl wasn't even from here. Um, a police Scotland spokesperson said, we are aware of the vandalism and carrying out inquiries. Anyone who knows who, who is responsible should contact Police Scotland on 101. And that should be about it. Like I said, I think I think from uh, genuine supporters of of uh, Luke Mitchell and Jody Jones uh, justice, uh, it's it's unfortunate um, that. Uh, People should spray graffiti, although it's understandable. Um, the other thing that sprung to mind was, of course, that, you know, the, the resident saying, you know, well, why do it here? It's not as if she's from here. Can't help thinking of that famous quote by um, Martin Luther King, which I will get absolutely word for word rather than hazarding a guess. It is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere um so anyway so it's taken a while and i do apologize for the fact that i didn't have up on screen the first of the articles so i will post one two three four five five of the articles in the list and uh, and we'll see uh, we'll see you all again next time um obviously tomorrow uh, looking forward to bren a chat with uh, Pete Dassey. Pete Dassey is telling me how much he's enjoying coming along and having a chat. So uh, um, look forward to a chat with Pete. Hopefully Jerome will come along and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Okay, uh, take care. Um, bye for now.